um, okay. So I am going to um, tell you a little bit about Kim Poole. Kim Poole is a soul fusion performing artist and founding fellow of the Teaching Artists Institute, providing an opportunity for artists to learn techniques for social transformation while fostering outlets for socially engaged art. Operating in the USA, Ghana, Liberia, Jamaica, Uganda, Tanzania, the Gambia, through Thai, Kim and an international team of teaching artists are originating the art of social transformation teaching artistry in action, curriculum and workbook for change agents and universities interested in exploring the art of possibility. Under the Thai umbrella, Poole serves as chief visionary of the Artisan Conference philosophy aimed at connecting sustainable development to art culture and emerging economies. As a performer, Ms. Poole has quietly become an international powerhouse with regular headline performances on the festival circuit in Ghana and South Africa. As a demonstration of art for transformation, she uses music and cultural narrative to empower African women in health and business. Locally in her hometown of Baltimore, uh, Baltimore Poole has recently established the Artists in Residence Program for community artists in need of housing and authentic opportunities for community service. So everybody, welcome. Miss Kim Poole. I was born by the river in a little tent. And oh, just like that river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, oh, a long time coming, but I know a change is gonna come, oh, yes it will. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. I don't know what's up, there on the skies. It's been a long, oh, a long time coming, but I know oh, a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. So I go to my brothers and my sister, yeah. And I say, brother, help me, please. But it winds up knocking me back down, back down on my knees. Oh, oh, oh. it's been a long, a long time coming. But I know oh, a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, should we? Much, Mama Rashida. I didn't realize we were gonna uh, read that entire bio. I would have made it a lot shorter. My name is Kim Poole, as Mama Rashida told you guys. And we do quite a bit, but today we're gonna talk about a few things. I didn't sing because I'm a soul fusion performing artist. I sang because it was important for me that you felt me before you attempted to try to understand what I'm gonna see. This is an example in action of African-centered art for social transformation. So I know that at MICA, I tried to learn a little about you all's mission and vision as a school and even in your community arts MFA to better understand the audience I would speak to today. But you see the African worldview is based on call and response. That vibration that you may have felt from my voice that I attempted to share even through this electronic medium 
it was a shared vibration. And so we do that through call and response. You see that in the church here with my brothers and sisters that may go to church on Sunday morning. When the pastors say amen, you say hallelujah. Let them know that you're there. Let them know that you're hearing me. And so I want you to feel free to unmute yourself. Right now, we're talking about the rules of engagement. You see, this is not a I sit and talk and you sit and watch and analyze and watch my facial expressions and digest alone how you feel and what you're thinking. The African-centered worldview gives you permission to share when you feel something. Just feel free to unmute your mic tonight. Go ahead and jump in. No need to ask permission, even though it's not ordered, even though it's not uh, numeric, even though it may not seem like a process that we all understand. I want you to feel okay and comfortable in chaos just for tonight, just for our power speaker series while Kim Poole has the mic. Now that we're kind of giving you permission to participate, I'm not just gonna leave it to you to do that on your own. I wanna start with definitions because today we're gonna talk about African-centered art for social transformation. And the question is, what does that mean? But before we talk about what that means, I have a question for all of you. What is the Community Arts MFA? I only need two people volunteer tonight. Please don't make me choose you. Please don't make me pick you. Just unmute yourself and let me know, let the people at home know what is a Community Arts MFA, because it sounds like a specialist. And we're going to talk about the specialists amongst the uh, world of artists and in community sectors, across sector. And uh, before we do, I just want to hear from you all, from the practitioners. What is a community arts MFA? Anybody? Cat Williams said it best. I'll wait. No problem. <laughs> Okay. Hey, Kim. I knew that you were going to be the first one. Thank you, Kenneth. <laughs> yes, um, Lafaka, um, Master of Fine Arts, Community Arts. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you mean oh, the, like the acronym? Yeah. Well, what is it? Oh, give me oh the oh the um the program. Or oh, the oh, you talking the about program, the um, that means to you. Oh, yes. So community, I say within that program and community arts means like definitely I always say like to um, to help those in the, in the communities, um, um, different communities. I feel as though where um, where I always say like where um, people, I would say residents have ideas or or something that is like, has a great need. And I feel as though where as community artists, we always fulfill that need because we always listen, we always um, hear the information, but we always, and it's off, I always would say it's more like, you know, with open arms as we, we, we come in, in terms of, you know, I say, I always say like, what do they, uh, what do certain members in the community or residents want um, in terms of, you know, you know, anything that's art related, but I always think it's, it's always a, a service or a need to um, to fulfill. Nice, nice. I appreciate that. You know, the performing arts, music especially, is very different from any other art form. We all know the parts of the brain. I'm sure at some point in your matriculation, you took psychology 101. So you know that in the frontal lobe, in the front of your head, you have all of your memories and your physical touch, depending on which portion of uh, the world you're interacting with. And then you have the temporal lobe on the side of your brain. And then in the very back, you have the occipital lobe. And the reason that performance art is really different, so necessary, but different from other art forms, especially music, is because of the way you experience it in your mind and body. When you see a painting and you see color from those paintings or the lack thereof, your brain interprets it for your body to feel and experience. In your occipital lobe, 
your brain interprets a variation in light. It travels from your retina all the way back to your occipital lobe and your brain tells your body, I am seeing the color red or gray. And then your body reacts to that and creates an emotion. You associate gray with certain feelings based on your culture and your worldview and your upbringing, or you experience red associated with power or whatever you perceive that color to be in your own worldview and family of enculturation. But in the temporal lobe, your auditory, your cochlea, your Warnicke's area, when you feel vibration, it's very different from any other art form because you need no interpretation. There is no intermediary between vibration and the way your body interprets it. If I plugged electronic nodes to your head to monitor vibration that your body felt, I would be able to tell you which chord progression was being played on a piano based on the level and the variation of vibration that you experienced. So what does that mean? That means as I speak to you when I'm on stage, if I say, hey, are you feeling me? That means that when someone drums, that your brain has nothing to do with it. Your body feels vibration directly. So in the African worldview, every artist is a performing artist because they have no choice but to tap into the vibration that is life, that your body feels directly with no interpretation. And so I say all of that to say, if you have a comment, please unmute yourself and say it so that we can feel your vibration directly, so that it is no intermediary so that we don't have to interpret it through multiple levels of interpretation and worldviews. When you say it, your energy and your intention comes along with it when we're able to hear it on the airwaves. So now I'm gonna ask for the second person. Thank you, Kenna. Thank you for letting me know with the community MFA. I want one more person, just one more. What is the community arts MFA? I don't know what that is, MFA. You can start there. I know that you have to pay money to get a piece of paper. I know it's really important, but please, one more person. What is a community arts MFA? I'll jump in. Um, I'm sorry my camera's off because I'm driving. Um, first of all, hi, Kim, you do not remember me, but we worked together almost 20 years ago at a performing arts camp. And I just want to say that I love you. And um, I am just so proud of everything that you are doing. Um, we are still friends um, on Facebook, by the way. But anyway, um, I am a, uh, a testimony of the Community Arts um, Master of Fine Arts program. Uh, community Arts, like we are a bunch of, like, excuse my French, uh, bomb ass humans that we are the life on campus. Like without Community Arts at MICA, like it, it like community arts at Micah, it just, you know, it just wouldn't exist if it wasn't for us. We are all walks of life. We like we're Baltimore, we're from all over. We are, you know, we experience uh all different kinds of mediums. Uh yeah, we just hungry to just, you know, give back to our communities and where we're from. And yeah, like, you know, community arts, like, you know, like even everybody on this call, you know, that represents Mafaka, like, you know, we the bomb.com, like, it, like we make the world go round on campus and off campus and all over. So I'm hoping that sums up what community arts is, but um, yeah, like we all have our own definition, but just to like make sense of it, like we, we just, you know, we the bomb, that's all. <laughs> I love that. Blow up bomb.com. Listen, I'm here for it. I appreciate you telling me that you are the juice. You are the energy. You are what's special about community arts. Um, that, hold on to that. We're going to revisit that. So now that I've gotten to know you a little better, and I hope that you have at least felt me a little better, um, I want to talk a little about tonight's topic. 
African-centered art for social transformation. I wanna begin with definitions. Many times when we communicate, we believe that we're speaking the same language and we are not. Uh, there's an incredible performing artist by the name of O.C. Davis. And he said that the English language is my enemy, a well-spoken, articulate man. I never understood fully why he felt that way until I began to travel internationally, especially on the continent and meet people that spoke three and four languages. Um, I now know that when he said the English language is my enemy, it was because English was his first and only language and language defines your reality. What would you think without the words that you think, right? How, how would you come up with ideas, concepts without the language you use to define those concepts? And when I thought about English in my own vernacular, I realized that I was using English to define myself and my community and none of those terms were good. Black listed, black bald, um, it went on and on and on. And I realized that through art, I was able to once again, find myself. I look at the hip hop movement and I see how we took command of the English language through our art and created a language within a language, a culture within a culture and created our own vernacular, colloquial speech. And so our creativity allowed us to do that. But there are still spaces, this is one of them. So for the sake of being on the same page, I wanna begin by basically defining African-centered art for social transformation. In the Teaching Artists Institute, what does that mean? It means that artists are integrated into communities, development, functionality, and trajectory. African-centered art for social transformation means that community artists are integrated into the community's development, functionality, and trajectory. So now let's go back to those words themselves because even though they have different meanings in the worldview of the Teaching Artists Institute. You see for us, African-centered, it speaks to the way we see the world historically and the way we see it futuristically. So I think about the fact that I'm an artist. I'm not a history teacher. I'm not here to give you guys dates. I'm not here to talk about social phenomenon. It doesn't mean that artists aren't aware of these things. It's just that we are the do it people. We are the action people. We get things done, we create. We interpret and we create and we do these things simultaneously. So African-centered, what that means is that I understand who I am, where I'm placed, and I understand a mission and a purpose. So I, th I think about, as a girl from Baltimore on the West Side, how I could be connected to Africa in general. And for the most part, it was art that reconnected me to my ancestry, that reconnected me to the African uh, in my identity, because my identity is beyond Baltimore, and my art allowed me to travel beyond Baltimore, experience other worlds and other regions on the continent, and then realize that Baltimoreans, Black, like myself, in my family line, were just as African as African people on the continent. But it was through my travels that I was able to understand that. African-centered, seeing the world from an African perspective, seeing a world in a way that understands the importance of promoting and preserving humanity. African people are the first people. Black women are the mothers of civilization. We were the first. And as a result of that, we established the standard for humanity. Uh, being in balance with nature, understanding uh, the human scale for interaction, uh, respecting balance, not just with nature, but with our brothers and our sisters, our natural resources, 
All of these things are attributes of what it means to be African-centered. I hope that that helps you better understand. Um, there are many indigenous cultures around the world that respect these uh, best practices for living, for life. Um, African-centered people being in balance, I find that with our Native American brothers and sisters here on Turtle Island is what they call it here in America. I also see it with the Aborigines in Australia. But I, as an African woman, have to always see the world from my own vantage point and my own perspective. And it's important for every teaching artist, every community artist to go into their own identity, go into their own history to find their worldview in order to create the art that connects with the community around them to create the art that is needed for their community specifically. So we've talked about African-centered in that definition, African-centered art for social transformation. Now let's talk about art because we, all of us are artists. We talk about art all the time, art this, art that. We hear a lot of politicians throw it around and use it. Now it's a buzzword. In the Teaching Artists Institute, art is simply creation. Even the ideas that you think, Inception, this is art for us. We've been put into a box. We've been told that art is what happens uh, when you paint, when you sing or dance, a theater, a drama. But art is the world around us and the world around us tells us a story. We'll talk about that story. We call that uh, the cultural narrative, the symbolic landscape, all of this is art. But because we've allowed the confines of this society to tell us that art is what happens at MICA, we don't ask for artists to have seats at decision-making tables, like an artist in residence on the board of estimates for the city of Baltimore, like an artist in residence for the Baltimore Development Corporation. Why? Because they've told us that those aren't art places. Those aren't places where artists belong because this is the definition of art that we have given to you. And this is the definition that you should use. So that goes back to language. It's important that we define language and take it back for ourselves. Just like me as an African woman learning that I spoke English and that was the only language I had to define my reality. I had to take that language back. I had to redefine it for myself in order for it to serve my own worldview. And that's what all artists need to do because this society has told us that this is the definition of art and this is what artists do. So that in the Teaching Artists Institute is our definition, creation. And who is the artist? The creator. So we're talking about African-centered art for social transformation. So what is social? Social, that's us, that's you, that's me. Everybody, together, collectivity, not necessarily uniformity, but unity on some level. That is social, us recognizing the necessity of our cohesion. We in the art world have been taught this individualistic uh, mindset. Our society perpetuates it. You go into your house, you go into your garage, you go into your car, maybe you have a side job, you go into your office, into your cubicle. You have a, a society that reinforces the value systems that it believes, that it values, that it perpetuates. And every mechanism that has been created around you, this art form that has been created, it reinforces the social sphere. And in an individualistic society, you find yourself lonely. And in the African worldview, we'll talk a little about some practical examples of the African worldview and art for social transformation. You find that your most creative self is birthed in community. So very important that social, art for social transformation is important. That social piece is dear to our ability to realize and maximize and manifest our art of possibility. 
That's what we call it here in the Teaching Artists Institute. And last but not least, transformation. What is that? That's a butterfly in metamorphosis. Transformation is the process. It's continual. It's understanding that we're on this train and we're never getting off. It doesn't end. Our problems are a part of the process. Our successes are a part of the process. Our creations are continually shaping themselves. They are shape-shifting creations. And that's okay. That's a beautiful process. And we're all a part of it. And the process shouldn't be seen as a destination. Everything is always continually changing. We've all heard that catchism, that, um, what is it called? The, the things we say, the, the catchism. Somebody, come on now, give me some energy. Come off your mic. Tell me, what is that called, anybody? The, the, it's, it, the, the, the phrases, what'd you say, Mama Rashida? I said cliche. Cliches, yes. We know those cliches. Um, a change is going to come indeed. It has, it will, and it will always be that way. Um, so now that we've gotten a few definitions out of the way, African-centered, what that means, what it has meant for me in my life, in my history, how I came to understand African-centered in my own life as a girl from Baltimore, traveling to different countries around the world, learning that I only spoke English, learning that I redefined English, created my own language through my art and defined for myself a language within my own tribe here in the U.S. and realizing that even though they picked us up from a, a place in the west coast of Africa or maybe central Africa that I'm still African even though I don't live there anymore and neither had my mother or my grandmother or my great great grandmother. It doesn't change that. And seeing that that was the vantage point for my artistic contributions to community and the importance of that being the place where I started my journey, identity, African-centered, what that not only meant for me individually, but what it means as for us as a community. Um, then moving into uh, art, just simply being creation and artists redefining that definition for the sake of our entire community's sustainability, ensuring that art is not devoid from other community institutions. Then moving into our definition of the social, knowing that social cohesion is us, unity, but not uniformity, our collective acknowledgement of our interdependence, and then going into the transformation, the process, the continual metamorphosis, and knowing that that is the goal to continually transform and recreate and not look for a final destination or resting place, but being comfortable in the process. This, by definition, is African-centered art for social transformation. So now let's talk about the comparative analysis. Because even though African-centered art for social transformation may be something that you agree to, you may hear some of these terms and their definitions and you say, mm-hmm, yeah, I understand the importance of my own identity and my contributions to community uh, transformation or community art. You may say, mm-hmm, I understand the importance of social cohesion and our collective acknowledgement of that. I understand the importance of the process. But how did we get to a place where art became so devoid from community function? Let's talk about that. Because this is the major turning point in African Center Art for Social Transformation. In the African village, which is a symbolic landscape that I use to draw lessons from the best of the African worldview, I think about two artists. The first artist is the griot. The griot is a storyteller in the African village, but the griot doesn't tell story for story's sake. The griot holds the history of the village. The griot is a genealogist. The griot is also connected intentionally to the youngest members of the society. 
So when you look from the outside in and not have any cultural context, you may say, oh, that's nice. Look at all the old grannies and grandpas telling stories to their grandchildren. But the truth is that that is a duality. That is an energy exchange. We talked about vibration and the importance of vibration for manifestation, for creation of new life, new concepts, new ideas. The energy exchange between the griot and the youngest members of the society is one that reminds the village of their trajectory. Because I told you that the definition of African-centered art for social transformation is artists, integration into community development, community functionality, and community trajectory. So that means that the elders, which are usually the griots in the African village, are connected to the youngest so that the next generation understands where the community is going, where the community is destined, and the community's purpose. So the griot in the African village is not just a storyteller. We look at Hollywood. These stories, they're manifesting every day. I mean, I really love this last movie. I, I can't think of the name of it now, but it was really good. I don't watch TV as often. I don't, I mean, it's something I do in past times, but I, I love a good movie. I watch any movie once, but these movies have no context. In general, they are not connected to the trajectory of our community. These storytellers are not interested in preserving or promoting our community history. Kim, are you clear about what we are? Do I see a question in the chat? Is that a transcription or is that a question? That was Mama okay. Rush. Yes, Mama Rashida. Go right on, jump right on in. You had a question? I, yeah, I did have a question. I know that um, how I came to know you, Kim, mm -hmm. was through my um, work with the Teaching Artists Institute. And I did want you to speak to, um, I don't know if I'm cutting into what you're talking about, but I want you, and I, not that what you're saying is absolutely important, but I also, because I wanna be sure that before we leave here that we know and talk about um, the Teaching Artists Institute and your work oh, and how you started that particular organization. And um, so I would like you to speak to that too as well. Yes, ma'am. I'll make sure you give me a time check. Okay. You just hold it right up on the screen. In my screen, I can see Miss Paula Phillips, Mama Ade Ole, um, Olome, Olomo, and then Kenneth Clements. That's who I can see. So when we get to the time, any one of y'all can unmute and give me the number on the screen and tell me I got 10 minutes. Trust me, I love to be a walk and talk and commercial for what we do with Teaching okay. Arts Institute. And yes. I would love so yes and so you got so um we do we we have until nine but i do want you to to uh talk about that as well yes ma'am all right thank you so uh before i got uh thinking about my promo and which program i was going to pitch to you guys and tell you that you need to participate with us um because art is your lifeline and you should work with us like your life depends on it. Um, I was talking about the lifeline of African-centered communities and the griot in many ways was the lifeline of the community because they ensured that the next generation understood their mission, understood their purpose, understood the trajectory of the community. So not storytellers for story's sake, but they understood that narrative is the most important art form because it teaches us how to learn. Every lesson you've ever learned has come through a story. And when you include storytellers into the development, functionality, and trajectory of the community, you have increased the sustainability of the community. You have ensured that that community will survive. The next artist in the African village that I wanna highlight is the drummer. Oh, I love that beat. <laughs> Whether it's in church on Sunday morning or the club on Saturday night, I love a good beat. It's something about it. I say all the time that we are the rhythm people. 
uh, it's something about vibration and rhythm that supersedes emotional state and what I'm thinking about. And it goes right into my, my veins. I, I feel the beat. And I can say that for most of us, vibration has a very impactful, um, it, it's impactful on your, your emotional state, but it's, it's something that calms you even when you don't understand it, it excites you, it, it gets your attention. And so even though all this is true, the drummer in the African village had a very specific purpose. They used those drums with different cadence during war times, if there was an enemy approaching their village gates, the drummer, he was a communication system. When there wasn't telephones or iPhone watches, in the African village, there were drummers. And these drummers served as a communication. They also ushered in certain spiritual practices or acknowledgments, the vibration that is life in the African village. It is acknowledged through vibration. It connects you to another level, a, a metaphysical level. And vibration was an indication of that in the African worldview. And so the drummer wasn't just the track on the beat of a nice song. The drummer was a part of community functionality. And so in the African worldview, artists were essential to operations in community. They were not auxiliary or auxiliary. Art is not one subject at school. Art is integrated as a pedagogy. It is how we learn. It is a part of every subject at school. The artist is there. Story is there. Vibration, the way that we connect, the way that we understand is there. And so now we're gonna talk about the original people, African worldview versus our newest, youngest brothers and sisters. You see, Europeans, Europe from east to west, they're African too. All people are African. They migrated at some point in our history to other regions of the world. And based on that migration, they learned to adapt to their environments. So Africa, I was going down the street one day in Zambia and Lusaka. You may not know where that is. It's in Southern Africa. And the taxi driver, uh, they started laughing at me because we were going down the street. It was so nice. On both sides of the street, there were mangoes as far as I could see. And I asked them, I'm still that girl from West Baltimore. I asked them, I said, who owns this land? This is so nice. I mean, mangoes everywhere. They just laugh and laugh and laugh. <laughs> and they eventually stopped laughing and said, Miss, nobody owns it. It just grows that way. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Even me making a purpose to find my African-centered life and worldview who works in seven different countries, six on the African continent, I'm still a product of European thinking and colonized educational system. Because in my mind, anything this nice had to be owned by somebody. Somebody owns it if it's this nice. You see, our African brothers and sisters that migrated to Europe, they went into an environment that didn't have mango trees just growing on both sides of the road. It was an icebox. Nothing grew naturally. And to be honest, I mean, you might even have to eat somebody right next to you if they froze. And I mean, this is survival of the fittest. This is how these ideologies manifest. This is how capitalism manifested out of European thinking, out of the fact that scarcity is real. Our environment has taught us that it produces nothing. We must continually consume, that we inherently feel a sense of lack. We inherently feel that our environment will not provide us what we need. And so we must make provision continually. We must continually consume. And these are the systems under which our current learning systems have developed. And so we must be intentional 
about going back to all of our origins. We are all African. So African-centered art for social transformation is going back to the origin of creation, the origin of humanity, and looking at those best practices, looking at what it means to be human, looking at how they survived, how they function, balance with nature, balance with man versus man. And it doesn't mean that there weren't issues too. There were many wars in Africa. There were many things that aren't the best of who we are as humans, but we have to look at the best of what we've exhibited. It doesn't mean that uh, we don't, what we do is we look at what's needed for our collective future. And our collective future means that in the African worldview, we acknowledge the integration of artists into community function, community functionality. When you think about Europe, I, I mentioned earlier the individualism that this system and worldview perpetuates in its design, in its creation, in its symbolic landscape and the cultural narrative that it creates and informs. I talked about the comparative analysis, African-centered versus European-centered, African-centered being communal, European-centered being individualistic by nature, by environment. I think about the art that has been created from the European paradigm and worldview. And it reminds me of a beautiful statue called the Thinker. You may remember him. He kind of goes like this, all white. He was, you know, carved out. I mean, it's an incredible statue, but the statue is symbolic. It represents the ideology of European worldview and the artistic forms that were birthed out of that worldview. I think, therefore, I am. But in the African-centered worldview, as it relates to art, it's based and pillared on the concept of Ubuntu. Last year, we took our conference to South Africa and I was able to experience that in practice. Ubuntu in the Zulu language, it means I am because we are. I am because we are. This is the foundation of African-centered worldview, communalism. There is no me without the community. You help me become more human. I'm not human because I think. I'm human because I'm with you. I'm human because you understand and see me. Through my reflection in your eyes, I better understand myself. I better understand my mission. I better understand my agenda in the community. We are interdependent. And so it's important that I give you this comparative analysis because currently we are conducting and developing community arts in a European context. And as we move back as a community to African-centered art for social transformation, or let's just take away the Africa part and forget about the language that sometimes keeps us from understanding each other. Let's just talk about getting back to humanity. Let's talk about getting back to balance, getting back to interdependence, being okay with needing somebody, being okay with understanding that I am not an island, that I am not an individual. It's not all about what I think. This is where we find our effectiveness. And I think Mama Rashida, that is kind of what leads me into the Teaching Artists Institute and the work that we've been doing for, I guess, seven years now. Um, so I spoke with you in the beginning a little about my own personal journey. Um, I'm a performing artist. Um, shout out to all the performing artists in your program. Um, and I sing. So I had opportunities to travel. I'm not Beyonce, I'm not even Jill Scott, <laughs> but, when I travel to some of the continent, um, continental countries, they pay my way, full round trip. I uh, get food and free hotels. And when I go and perform, it's a stadium full of people that came 
to hear my music. And there might be a couple other people in the, you know, lineup too, but they came to hear me. And this was not the Africa they told me about. And so I was confused. At first, a little hesitant to even go and explore those markets in my music. Um, but I went free vacation, free, free trip, and I got an opportunity to do my work. And I realized when I got on the ground that the story they knew about my tribe in America was not the one that they needed. They used BET and commercials, and this was how they decided who me and my people were. And, you know, as Africa has always been, I guess, there were lots of people there from Europe, you know, Germany, and I mean, many places, China, all from all over Asia, but there weren't many Black people from my tribe that were there. And so I realized that it was important for me to bring my art form there. And in the process of bringing my art form there, being excited about the fact that they actually wanted my art and it didn't matter that I wasn't Beyonce, um, I started to notice the gap in the society. Uh, we live in the illusion that there is a middle class. <laughs> we said, oh, I'm in the middle, that's okay. <laughs> in Africa, that illusion, that glass, that camouflage is completely shattered. Um, it is the haves and the have nots and you see it every day. And so I began uh, to realize that I needed to be a part of the solution. Um, I was trying to get away from Baltimore. Uh, as a girl from Baltimore, born and raised, you see the open air drug market. You see dilapidated buildings. You see rampant prostitution if you just go down Walbrook. And you see, you know, just things that as a child, you begin to normalize. These things are normal. Everybody has testers in their apartment building on the floor. All you do is walk around them. You just don't touch them. If you're at the playground, you might see a needle that somebody used from shooting up. You know that you don't touch it. You walk around it. Uh, you know, prostitution is something that sometimes you have to do to pay your bills. You don't disrespect her. You just don't look. You pretend like you don't see it. Dilapidated buildings are okay. Every community has just a few. And um, it's no big deal, as long as my house is nice, even if it's attached to a dilapidated or vacant building. The, as a child growing up in Baltimore, you normalize this cultural narrative and your symbolic landscape, i.e. the institutions that have been created in your world, you decide at some point that it's normal and that it's okay. And so when I begin to travel to the continent, I realized that this wasn't normal. <laughs> you know, I, at first I was trying to figure out what is different. Why, why do I feel different? And then I said, oh, there's no open air drug market. <laughs> Nobody's leaning to the ground and not falling. That, you know, I see, I, I mean, there are buildings that haven't finished being developed, but there's no dilapidation. It wasn't, I didn't feel a sense of neglect. I felt progress. I felt like this is a transformation. This is something in progress. And so I, I started to do those comparative analysis between my personal experience. And I realized that I, I couldn't just come and perform anymore, that I had to do more than just the show. And the only people that I saw were, you know, young girls from Peace Corps that the embassy had signed off on. And I took it into my own hands. And I said, you know what? art for social transformation, I can do that and I don't need permission. I don't need legitimacy. In the European worldview, living in this context and in this paradigm, you begin to believe that you are not legitimate enough as an artist. Oh, I'm not Beyonce. Oh, I'm not Jill Scott. I didn't sell a million records. Oh, I don't have a degree. I'm not Dr. Such and Such. Oh, I'm not legitimate enough. Oh, I didn't make a million dollars from my best-selling book. So you begin to lessen your value and you begin to do that because your society tells you that you aren't good enough. So when I went to the continent and I started to work in art for social transformation, it inspired me to continue because it didn't matter. All they wanted to see were, were results. 
small results mattered, big results mattered, engagement, even that was a win. When you had the people's attention and they wanted to be there, when you were able to connect with the young people across, you know, when you spoke with different sectors and they were surprised that artists had even the, uh, the audacity to speak to people from other sectors. That was impressive. And I said, you know, this is something we need to continue. And so we started that work in Nigeria. I went there in 2014. We performed across the country raising funds for girls that were abducted by the Boko Haram terrorist sect. And at the time, you know, I just, I partnered with the Rotary Club of Ikeja. Uh, Ikeja is the capital of Lagos. Um, and that's a, a really big state in Nigeria. And um, when it was time to leave the drummer, Uh, I said, what am I going to do? I've been in Nigeria almost two months. I'm about to lose my day job. I've, I thought I was more than just the person that spoke about it, that talked about it. I wanted to be an artist that did something about the problems that I saw around the world. And he said, yeah, but when you were on stage, you talked to the audience and you said that we should do something about it. And I thought you had something for us to do. And I said, no, no, I meant hyper, I meant, you know, like, Metaphorically, hypothetically, you should do something about what you see wrong in your community. And he said, oh, and the disappointment in his voice, I carried that with me on the flight back to Baltimore. And I realized that that work in Nigeria was only the beginning, that there was so much more that needed to be done. And so here we are seven years later and we actually don't even have an office in Nigeria right now, but we hold office in seven different countries, including Baltimore. Um, we focus on African-centered art for social transformation, and that looks different in every area because every area needs something different based on the symbolic landscape. When we're in the Gambia, they need to understand that farming is cool, that agriculture is paid, that it's also indigenous and that it needs to be promoted, preserved and protected. Because when they think about uh, what um, professional people do, they think about ties and suits and office, but they don't understand that agriculture in an agrarian society is foundational. So when you lose that, you'll lose your ability to be sustainable. So we took hip hop artists from across the country and they created songs. They did an entire marketing campaign to reach out to young people and teach them how sexy farming was. And I really believe that so many of the young people in the audience that day and in the major um, at that University of Ghana in Lagoon and in the study abroad program enrolled into uh, agriculture and what they call agronomics. Uh, because of the hip hop artists changing the narrative, because hip hop artists had the microphone, they had the attention of the young people. And for that moment, because of our organization, they used it to change the mindsets and to shift, to encourage a paradigm shift around agriculture in Ghana and the Gambia. Um, so that is what is needed, a mindset change in those countries. But when I think about my own city, here in Baltimore, I think about our newest program that Mama Rashida mentioned earlier, um, the artists in residency, providing opportunities for affordable housing uh, for the artist community. Because right now the housing market, I keep hearing people say, oh, it's a seller's market, it's a seller's market. I was talking to my cousin the other day and she said, Kim, they raised my rent by $450 and is that legal? I mean, can they do that? And I say, yeah, actually they can. And I think about my own community artists, those that are practicing in the community and traditional performance and how we don't have um, pay stuff all the time and we don't have credit history all the time and how we are sometimes working outside of our field 
just so that we can survive. And so we spend more time in that institution than we do creating and engaging in creativity, innovation, and design. And I said to myself, Baltimore needs a paradigm shift, not because artists are under and overhoused, but because artists are the community immune system. Artists have to be integrated into community functionality, and we need to be more intentional about it. So this newest program in Baltimore is ensuring that every community has an artist in residence. Right now, we only have one housing accommodation. It's in the Park Heights community. It's the Northwest region of Baltimore. And we have one artist in residence. Her name is Bobby Rush. And we're excited to bring her into the house uh, March 15th. But this is the beginning of a movement that's local that's needed right here in my own city. Yes, we work in seven countries, but Nas, is a rapper I love so much, I quote him all the time. And he said, how you help other places when you ain't help home yet. And so I will always be committed to doing work in Baltimore. Um, I'll always uh, be committed to ensuring that we provide systems to integrate artists into community functionality. Ultimately, the African-centered art for social transformation is to ensure that the community's functionality considers artists across sector because the artist also needs the community, but the community also needs the artist. And we've been told that the artist is, I, I remember when I told them I wanted to be a music major and they said, oh, you're not serious. You need law school. You're, you speak well, go to law school, do something serious with your life. I remember, uh, when I think, I don't know, what was, uh, she was one of my students. At one point in my journey, I was a community schools coordinator. And so I taught at Northwestern High School. That's also in Park Heights. Uh, I taught at um, Calverton Middle School. That's in West Baltimore. And um, so I, I was talking to a girl, I forget which school she was at, um, because we integrated, we created a community choir because the kids told me their school didn't have an art, my music program anymore. And I, as a singer, I couldn't imagine a school without a music program. I didn't know that that existed um, because I grew up in a school that always had a music program. And so when the young girl came and told me um, that, you know, we, she wanted to sing and we started a choir, the principal, and I, I, I won't say her name, but if you were around in 2008 or 2007, and you just so happen to know who the principal was at Calverton Middle School, then you know her name. Um, but this principal told me we had to focus on what mattered. That's why they didn't have a music program at the school, because they had to focus on what mattered. And African-centered art for social transformation is this, understanding that art pillars our community's reality. Artists define reality. They teach us what to think. They teach us how to think. And as artists, we have to take responsibility for helping our community unlearn what we have been taught about the significance and the necessity of art. So I'm gonna stop. I've been talking a lot and call and response is so important to how we do things. You felt my vibration. I love to hear a lot of questions. Please ask me things. Please challenge what I've said. Please say something, turn off your mics. Let me know you're still here um, because you guys are the experts. And I want you to know that the young lady said it earlier. She said that we are the bomb.com. We are what's happening on campus and it's true. And you are that what's happening on campus, what's happening in the community with a MFA in community arts or without it. You were always who you are. You were always a community artist. And now you're just putting letters behind it for the legitimacy that that provides you and the upward mobility it will allow you in this society. But don't forget who you are and the reason that you do this work. You come to this work informed with what you need because it comes from within. Knowing that is the African worldview. 
we understand that inside of you, you're born with everything you need. And your job is to continually manifest that, create it, understand it, transform it, and do it all over again. That is the process. So please come off mic, ask some questions, make some statements. Um, I don't have a question in particular, but um, I just wanted to make a statement about like when you were talking about the different artists in the African community and um, specifically you're talking about the drummer and I like witnessed this like firsthand. I used to be a host for an African dance class on Zoom um, and the drummer for the class, it was for like little kids. Um, and he would like explain to them about how like if he changes the beat of how he's drumming, it indicates like a certain movement for the dancer to do. And then he would like demonstrate with the dancer and like he would not talk at all. And he would just change how he was like doing the beat and the dancer knows exactly what he wa he's like telling them to do. Um, and it was just like really amazing to see how like they're communicating and working together, but they're not talking to each other. So just when you were talking, it made me think about that. Nice, yeah, drum, I mean, drumming is complex. I don't even begin to understand the complexity of drumming. Um, but what I do know is this, uh, we had a rhythm people I say um, in the beginning was heart drum. With this vibration, we gave rhythm to the world. On this beat, we sing life. We are the rhythm people. And as long as you can hear the beat of your heart inside your chest, it reminds you of that. So, you know, I just say that, you know, the heart is the first drum. And so the physical manifestation of that is only a representation. It's only an extension of the human body and your inner self. But thank you for that testament. That's what we do. Hallelujah. That's when you give your testimony. I love testimonies. Can we get some more testimonies or some contributions? Paula, Paula, you want to say? I'm mute your yeah. mic, Paula. Oh, yes, <laughs> I'm trying. Okay. I'm trying. My fingers can't Alexa, find it. Listen, Alexa, hold on, um, um, Kim. Yes. One second. Um, Paula is asking, uh, um, she's still there? She wanted to make a statement. I do. I do. Uh, I, I am very interested. I mean, you have been excellent. Thank you. Uh, this is one of the best overviews I've heard this, this academic year. So thank you very much. Um, I'm fascinated with your work. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, and appreciative of your commitment to people uh, in our communities, no matter where they are. Okay, whether overseas, uh, in Africa, in countries there, or here in the US. Um, I'm, I'm also extremely curious about your process and how you organize uh, to work with people here in the city, in Baltimore, knowing that we have so much strife, uh, so much hurt, so much disappointment. So how do you um, manage to bring people together of any age group uh, who have disparity uh, in thoughts in what they want for their community uh, when they can't agree. So how do you how do you do that through the Teaching Artists Institute? Okay, what 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 is your process there? Where do you start? Right. Uh, so first of all, that's an incredible question. Um, I started uh, my journey in youth development. Um, I was a young person myself. And when I looked at my peer group as a community schools coordinator, I was only 20 years old. And that was after managing like uh, many different youth programs and excursions and ROTC and all kinds of stuff. And uh, at the height of my work in Baltimore, I was a community schools coordinator and the principal was my partner during that period and I was only 20. And I realized that I needed to go and get my best life, that I was doing youth development programming and I was still a young person. And at that point I had not seen outside of Baltimore. So I decided that I needed to go in and I needed to go out. So that's when I began to sing more and journey to the continent on the 
festival Chitlin circuit and get my trips paid for and perform. And that was a breath of fresh air for me. It's so important self-care for the community artists because you are the light. The community is depending on you for resuscitation. So ensuring that you are taken care of, that has to be foundational in your practice. And so first and foremost, if I was to use my own life as an example, it was when I left Baltimore that I had the energy to come back and be a part of the solution. Because going into the continent was like a breath of fresh air. They have problems too, but I didn't feel as closely related to those problems because I was from Baltimore. And so when I went to the continent and started working over there, I did that for about five years before I really turned and came back and said, I want to go back home. I want to work in Baltimore. I want to help us. I want to help me. I want to work with the artists that I grew up with. I want to, you know, I, it, it was after I left and came back. And so what I saw that is my own personal um, oasis and mental break. And sometimes you need to make sure that you not only, not sometimes, always, you need to make sure you have a mental and physical oasis and incorporate that into your life. And sabbaticals were not created as a luxury. They are a necessity for community artists. You must plan them into your life's trajectory. I, I don't know if it should be on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, a yearly basis, but make sure that that's necessary. So your second uh, or the second part of your question was about engagement. Um, engagement is always easier with young people. A lot of people, they say, oh, youth engagement is so difficult. What are we going to do to talk to the young people? But I find that to be the easiest level of engagement because I don't fight the system. I'm not trying to recreate the wheel. The artists, performing artists especially, have the ear of the young people. They always have. They've never lost touch. Go into youth popular culture and meet them where they are. Meet young people where they are. Use the artists as your tool. The same way that we use hip hop artists in Ghana and Gambia to change the narrative around agriculture is the same way that we use, need to use hip hop artists and whatever artists are hot, engage them and use them as your tool. Use the artists as your tool to engage the young people. And once you have the attention of the young people, the rest of the community will fall in line. Don't forget your elders, though. A lot of people, you know, when they look at uh, European culture, they see that elders, once you get a certain age, you go to a special home, just like their art, right? The artists are experts, and so they belong in a special place, in a museum, put away, separate from the community. And the elders, the elders, once they get to a certain point where they're no longer functioning on this rat race wheel, when they no longer have a function that we can easily identify, when they have become an inconvenience, we put them away in a special home, away from the community. But that is not our way. That is not an African-centered way. We value the elder class. And so when it comes to community engagement, don't forget the young people. Use the artist as your tool to engage them and never forget the elders. The elders that have their memory, the elders that have stood the test of time, they are like a compass. And not only are they like a compass, they help naturally engage the family unit, especially the ones that live their life, a life that you can hang your hat on. Those are the elders that you need at your table. They will engage your community. So if you wanna keep doing this work and doing it long-term and not get burnt out, get away, go, leave. And when you come back, you'll have a renewed sense of energy and a new perspective. And if you want to engage community, get the babies and get the elders. Everybody else in between will fall in line. Okay. So I how do you answer the question? Yeah, almost, almost. That was excellent, but almost. Um, so when you have your participants, okay, regardless as to the age group, how do you mm -hmm. determine what it is they want to do? How do you determine the process for that uh, writing of, we, we call them curricula and action plans, uh, but how do you determine the goals? How do you determine, I mean, 
It could be millions of things. There are millions of things to do. Are you there? I think we lost her. I'm not sure we may have lost her. Oh, wait. Kim, are you here? Kim? Yeah, she may have to reconnect. Okay. Um, I did want to say while she's reconnecting, yeah, she'll have to reconnect. Yeah. Um, I did want to say, and I think um, um, one of the reasons why I absolutely um, asked Kim to join us um, and the Teaching Artists Institute was that um, this is the organization. Is she coming back yet? Oh, she's on. Kim? Are you back with us? Yes, I'm so sorry. My phone died. Please okay. try to get to my logistics <laughs> and not my heart. Okay, no problem. Whoa. Are you with us now? Yes, please ask your question. So how did you hear anything at all from me in this last part? I heard you say that there was another part. Yes, okay, so there is another part. So what we are, I myself and others are interested in also is once you have the group of, oh, you're just so beautiful. I'm sorry, I had to say it, okay? Just so beautiful. Uh, but how do you determine with the group of people that you're working in what it is you're gonna do, okay? And do you write a curricula? Do you have action plans? Are they long-term projects? Are they short-term projects or a combination of that? Where do you start? Do you start with a circle, okay, where people are getting to know one another, okay? Uh, most people in, in Baltimore and in, in, in our neighborhoods really do already know one another, but sometimes it's not that way. Sometimes it's a larger thought, a larger initiative where people don't know one another. So how do you organize people to begin to uh, get on the same path toward a common goal? so that they can have success from what it is they want for their community or, and for themselves? Um, so I think the first place, um, so I heard two questions. Um, one sounded like what I do in a space when I'm organizing people for the moment. And then the other seemed to be around organizing the community around a collective objective um, objective that is continual, like Correct. trans, like the process. Mm -hmm. And first, I'll say that to eliminate the assumption that we don't all have the same objective, we always have to do that because we've learned so many things that are considered best practices that just aren't in the European worldview. Even a crackhead love her babies and want to see them win. Our human nature is the same. We are all the same. We all want the same things. We all want sustainability. We all want to thrive and be happy and enjoy our space. So the question is how, right? That's when we begin to differ. That's when we see the variation, but the goals, we all want the same thing. Um, and so once we remember that in any situation, in any argument, in any uh, difference in approach, uh, once we remind ourselves in that conversation, in that moment, in that exchange, that we all deep down in our heart drum want the same things, it makes it easier to, to be different. To, to disagree because that's like, okay, we're only disagreeing about methodology, but we're going to the same place. We have the same destination. Um, I think that that uh, is foundational for that. How do I get everybody to align around being productive on an ongoing transformational uh, way? I think in the space um, with a, a group that you engage with across art form, Remember the performing arts, remember the African village, remember community artists as a tool um, in function 
functionality. And last but not least, remember that you define reality. So they've taught us that you go into communities and you ask the community what they want. But we have malady in our communities in Baltimore. And as a community artist, sometimes you have to set the agenda. Sometimes you have to be the spark, the source of innovation, the source of imagination. So you are there to agitate the limits of reality. And, but at the same time, sometimes you have to be the one that decides. And it's okay to be the decider. We're so diplomatic. We've been cultured now because we've been offensive in this European society for so long. Now everybody wants to be politically correct because we've been so, um, what is it called when you just, I mean, just offensive is a good word. Uh, the English language is my enemy. It's offensive. This society is so offensive to so many people for so long. Now it's just taboo to say anything that's against uh, you know, the norm, to do anything that isn't conducive to how everybody feels. It doesn't make everybody feel good. But sometimes as an artist, you have to stand up and you have to do what's uncomfortable and you have to set the agenda and you don't always have time to get engagement from everybody. But the people that you do engage, work with them, build something strong, build something powerful, be a beacon of light and the other people will begin to see it too. I don't know if that went you, off. You did, you did. But as you are speaking, you're causing me to think of other things, which is good. Okay, that's a good thing. All right, that's a good thing. Uh, so what kind of projects or initiatives or goals have you engaged in with the people of Baltimore City communities? Wow, so um, that we could be here for another hour. <laughs> Go forth. <laughs> we'll, 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 get, we'll give you a time out, okay, if you go too far, okay, but just start. I'm, I'm always super excited about our projects. Um, first of all, they're all global. It's not just about Baltimore. And this concept that we're supposed to only focus on our city and to be laser focused on the agenda, but it, it's just bigger than Baltimore. And sometimes the solution for Baltimore is getting Baltimore to see outside of itself. You don't know how many young people we've transformed or started on their journey of transformation because we simply took them on a trip outside of Baltimore. Right. It's been like travel. Travel is a journey. It's also learning. I mean, you, the classroom setting itself is just anti-learning. Learning happens in the community. The community is your classroom. And community artists, teaching artists know that. And so when it comes to the programs that we're developing, it's always global, meaning global, local. Um, and I love that term so much, even though we didn't create it, because it's even wherever you are, it reminds you that this space is so much bigger than me. I'm just one piece of this entire space. My perspective and contribution matters, but it's, it's bigger than me. And it reminds you of all these interdependent pieces working together simultaneously all the time. And even though my life may be crap and things may not go well, and I might have problems that I'm not the only one. And sometimes that helps you deal with it better. So some of our programs, before I get on my soapbox and start talking about what I think, um, they work with young people. We have programs that take history off the page and bring it to life. We use living history reenactments. Um, here in Baltimore, we have the Underground Railroad Excursion. It's an old history-based youth camping trip. And it was developed locally um, because uh, I said to myself, we do tours. That's one of the way that our uh, organization sustains itself because we are, aren't grant funded. And um, so our tours help with our overhead. And I said, what's a story from my own area that's so big, that's so important that the entire world should know about it, should want to learn about it, that's right here. And I said, well, shucks, that's Harriet Tubman. <laughs> I mean, she literally was enslaved. She emancipated herself. And then she did it for a rack of other people over and over again. And she's right down the street. And the largest um, 
you know, museum dedicated to an African-American woman is right down the street in Cambridge, Maryland. And then I think about Frederick Douglass, like the same thing. He emancipated himself, pretended that he was a sailor and then came to Baltimore and eventually moved to New York and down to DC. And he did the same thing. And, you know, so there's so many stories like that, Benjamin Banneker, but all of that is irrelevant to young people today. I'm like, shucks, it was a long time ago. Um, but it's really still relevant. And being creative enough to develop this program, I think it's a celebration because we literally dress up in character pieces. Like one of our elders will be Harriet Tubman and that'll be her role uh, for, you know, that day. And I dress up as a, you know, enslaved woman. We have uh, women at the Hansel House that dress up as Quakers and they, you know, use their Hansel House a uh, place that they're literally restoring to its original likeness from the colonial area in Vienna, um, Maryland, down in the Eastern Shore area. And they open those doors and they cook colonial meals. They talk about that story. And then we have the Native Americans that uh, have a compound um, on this same property and they tell their story. And we together talk about this era in history and the Underground Railroad, how it was multiple people across multiple cultures that understood that enslavement was a, a, a crime against humanity. And they knew that intrinsically from their heart drunk. And so we worked together to tell how different cultures interacted with that, um, what was happening during their history. But this is how we make it relevant. We make it entertaining because we dress up in costume as we sing songs and poems and give little soliloquies and, you know, little, I don't know, theater and drama stop pit breaks, but we make it relevant because the average kid in Baltimore can't swim, afraid of water, live on the water, know nothing about the waterways. So this is your now day. How do you think these people escaped? Guess what? They weren't afraid of the water. Frederick Douglass knew the waterways. These uh, young people in the urban jungle never been outside with enough trees where they can't see a building on the skyline. Just have never done it, never interested, never even understood why it was necessary, not from that environment. And so we tell them that these Harriet Tubman's and Frederick Douglass's, they lived off the land. I had a young girl, sometimes I've been, I bring uh, indigenous herbs and spices from the places we work around the world and I sell them here in Baltimore and different places in the US, Ohio, where Mama Ade is, et cetera. A little girl came to my station and um, she said, oh my God, it's dirty. And you know what she was talking about, right? A sweet potato. She said, it's dirty. And I looked at this child because I, I was almost embarrassed because I realized that she didn't understand that sweet potatoes grew inside the ground, in the dirt, or should I say in the soil. And that, that is how disconnected young people were from just basic life and processes like food growth and how important it is to take them out of the urban jungle where they understand some of the lessons and put them into another environment so that they have a clean slate, so that they don't have any preconceived assumptions about how this space works. And that sometimes is a perfect ground to plant new seeds when they're outside of a place of comfort, when they don't know, when they trust you enough to take them there. And when they're so far away from home that they can't go back now, even if they change their mind where they have to listen, where things are quiet in the background so they don't have any distractions. Some I've seen break down into tears. And I, you know, we go in their tent and we're like, what's wrong with you? I just, you know, just crying about things in their life. Like it's so quiet that now they're just thinking about things that they haven't had to think about in a while. And so we've had all kinds of experiences over the past couple of years doing the Underground Railroad excursion with some of our young people from not just Baltimore, but Ohio. And we have it again this year. 
August 12th through the 14th. This year, we're going to include young people into our leadership team. So we're taking them down to the Shenandoah Valley, March 19th through the 25th, to train them to be a part of our leadership team for this year. We also, in July, uh, June, uh, locally here, um, or I'll say locally in the United States, not only in Baltimore, but we're going to do the Freedom Rides. And so we're taking young people on a journey through the civil rights movement using the lens of youth activism artists during that period. And so we're getting on a bus and we're going down to North Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, um, these regions, Arkansas. And, um, you know, they'll learn about these stories in the places where they took place through the eyes of youth and art um, artists, and they're on the bus just like they were back then. And so not seeing uh, engagement as, um, I don't know, you know, murals. And I love murals, you know, ancient Egypt had murals everywhere. They meant many important things about spirituality and life and et cetera. But uh, being interactive, I think uh, for our organization, we do that through travel because I know how important travel is to the learning experience. Um, and uh, how important it is to come outside of your environment of comfort to learn something new, uh, because you have so many assumptions about what's happening around you that you just assume you already know what the instructor is talking about, and you've seen all this before, and when you go to a new environment, it's like, this is all new. I am open, wide open, and so when we have that, we plant those seeds. So we have that program, the Underground Railroad Excursion. We have the Baltimore Freedom Rides. Um, I don't know. And right now we're going to uh, develop the schedule and release it uh, May, May 21st. Uh, we're having the uh, community open house for our artists and residents in Park Heights. So right now we're knee deep in construction, renovations, and in May, we want you guys to come on out and meet our teaching artists, our artists and residents, learn more about that program and what we're targeting as the next house, and to learn about the schedule of activities that she's going to be offering from that space on a quarterly basis. Um, Outside of that, that's pretty much the local schedule. Of course, we have many international programs and we have a lot of local artists that will be traveling with us around the world. Our, our Summer Learning Institute, Mama Rashida can tell you a little more about that. We're trying to beg and plead that she joins us again this year. She came with us last year uh, with uh, three members, four members from Wombworks uh, to uh, basically do arts integration across sector for college students looking for study abroad. And um, so that was really good. We call it teaching the art of possibility, arts integration into healthcare, arts integration into community development, arts integration into education, where they usually put us, arts integration into technology or STEAM. Um, I think arts integration into social justice, that was Mama Rashida's track. So just looking at art integrated into other sectors. Um, that is the purpose of the program over the summer in Tanzania. We'll also do that program in the Gambia. We have our international conference every year. It happens once a year. This year, it'll be in November, and we're looking at Kenya or Zimbabwe. We've been invited to host the conference in both places. Um, so depending on which place our elders decide. Uh, we will host there and we'll use the next country for the subsequent year. Um, and you're all invited. If you're interested in getting your passport, we can help you do that. Um, I see questions though. Uh, yes. make sure I was gonna say, I see some questions and um, I can read if you wanna, if you'd like me to, uh, Kim. Please. I think the first one that I saw, um, let me just be sure. Um, Paula asked, how, this was, how do you earn trust? That was one, Paula. Correct, and there's another one. Uh, and, uh, and there's actually two parts to that. How do you earn your trust with the young people? And then you're going, you're taking people's children away. Okay, <laughs> all right. They are going everywhere, like, all over the world uh, in a way. Okay, so how do you earn the trust of their families and caregivers? Okay, 
Um, so another two part question I heard first, how do you earn the trust of the young person? And then how do you earn the trust of, of their family? Uh, in a way. Um, so I think that the first is with the family. Um, so consistency. Uh, people see you even though you don't know they're watching. And um, like I said earlier, even a woman on crack love her babies. And so it doesn't mean that because somebody is sick or dealing with um, some type of malady that they don't still interrogate you when it's time for you to take what they hold most dear and valuable, which is their young people. And so a lot of the logistics on paper only protects you from liability, um, which is what this system is designed to do, protect itself from liability. And we begin to mimic those systems. Oh, sign this waiver. Make sure you don't sue us. Sign this. We're going to get this insurance policy to make sure that uh, we're protected. And so when, once you're able to demonstrate to the family that you're truly there to protect the young person, not just protect them, uh, what do you call it? I mean, I mean, I guess it's mental and physical, not to just protect them from, you know, physical harm, mental harm. That I think is what you build over time. Consistency matters. Show up, show up consistently. Um, and be your authentic self. When it comes to the young person, that's how you get them. Consistency. When you let them know who you are, they let you know who they are. Young people are so like, I don't know what, if it's a gift. Um, some people call it empath. They see you. And as we get older, because of neural cement and being time warped, for some reason, we don't see as clearly, but they are sponges, they absorb you and they see you. That vibration from the drum, the one that we mentioned in the heartbeat, it is real. And those young people are vibrating at a frequency that allows them to fully see you, even when they don't fully understand. And so it's so important that you let them know immediately, don't conceal, let them see you completely. Because if they see you without you being transparent, they don't trust you. They already have so many reasons to not trust you, especially if you represent an institution that they inherently feel is not in their best interest. So like um, the school system, most young people are in school. They already inherently feel that the school system does not have their best interest at heart. So when you come into the school system, they have a reason not to trust you because you're coming in as an agent of an institution that they don't feel has their best interest at heart. And there are a lot of different clues. We could talk about that, um, you know, if we have the time that let them know inherently that that system doesn't support their development holistically. They don't always know why, but they, they know it inside in their heart drum. And so you have a reason to be distrusted, but when you are transparent, when you show up your whole self, um, and they see that and they do that comparative analysis and they see what she's showing me is what I'm seeing because I see her completely. Then that gives them an opportunity to begin trusting you. But I want you to remember that just like me growing up in Baltimore, the environment doesn't make young people feel safe. It makes them feel on edge and it makes them feel like they have to protect themselves. So sometimes what you see as them not trusting you is just naturally what they're doing as a defense mechanism to protect themselves because their environment, remember we talked about environments, the cold, desolate environment that Europeans travel to after leaving Africa, the mango trees on the side of the road, and sometimes it grows that way. The environment that I grew up in with the dilapidation, open air drug market, prostitution, and all of these things, they teach you lessons. They teach you a story. The cultural narrative, they tell you, they teach you who you are, how you should behave, and what is necessary for survival. And young people in our area have been taught that they have to protect themselves, right. even from allowing you to penetrate their emotion. Because being overly emotional or letting people know how you feel could be a liability in some communities. So they learn how to turn that off. And it's not as easily turned back on. 
It doesn't mean that you're not connecting with them. It just means that you can't just jump out of that war-like state of mind. You're at war. You understand that. Your environment lets you know. It teaches you. Story is the most important art form because it teaches you everything you know, remember, comes from story. So their story of their environment has taught them that they are at war. And a soldier doesn't just stop being a soldier because you decided you want to connect with them. So don't feel like they need to show up the way that you have interpreted emotion looks like for them to be engaged. They might be engaged. You might have their attention. But if it doesn't look to you like what this society has told you engagement looks like, keep talking, keep reaching out. You're connecting, you're being impactful and you'll see those seeds as they grow. Or maybe you don't. Some seeds you plant, you don't get a chance to see grow. Keep planting. Yes. I'm, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna thank share a, a few more of the comments. Um, thank you, uh, Kim. Um, Molly Hurley said two things. Um, one, a fun an anecdote, and one, a question. First, what consideration is put into the level of graphic detail and performances featuring enslaved people when performing for particularly young audiences? Um, it's important to know how bad things were. Some graphic details are arguably too harsh to show audiences below a certain age. And um, the second was the fun anecdote is that a friend of mine and the sister did not know you're supposed to wash potatoes before cooking them until they were like 19. The girl <laughs> literally tried to make a baked potato once and her friends were like, aren't you gonna wash that? And she, she was like, I'm supposed to wash it. <laughs> anyway. My people in the urban jungle. Right. <laughs> have to go back to the farm. It's a must. Oh God. Yeah. Um children were slaves too. They were enslaved. Um and these young people in Baltimore have seen things that you can't even imagine. And though we want to protect their innocence, that a part of building relationship and being trust means trusting that they're able to handle the truth. And it doesn't mean that you're ratchet. It doesn't mean that you don't protect their innocence again, but you tell them the whole story because they're gonna need the whole story. We can't pretend that we're not where we are. Our communities are sick for a reason. We have to go through that history so that we can heal. And we have to heal from the origin we don't want to wait until they're adults to begin the healing. The healing has to happen as you're a child so that they can hopefully heal our community so that they can change us. So I don't believe that young people have to wait until they're adults to be leaders, to lead. I don't think that you as a young person have to wait until you grow up to be an artist. And I don't think that to engage in African-centered art for social transformation, you have to be you know, an elder, babies can do that. We learn from them. Um, everybody in the community is a part of this process. And so when it comes to our programming with the Underground Railroad Excursion, the youngest uh, young person that we've had in the program was nine years old, Lana. And uh, when you're that young, we ask that a parent come with you. Um, and so we allow them to decide at what point their child needs to step away or put their hands over their ears. And I can say that there wasn't one moment in the programming last year where the young girl stepped away. Um, now she, she didn't like all of the camping. Um, you know, she didn't necessarily like, it was a rainstorm <laughs> in the night that we camped in Eastern shore. And she didn't like that sleeping in a tent while it was raining outside. You know, she was Miss Cute. Little Lana. Um, at the same time, uh, the history. Listen, our babies are wise. They they get it. They see us. They <laughs> they are ready for a difference, and they want explanation. They like looking around. They see in our communities the dilapidation, the problems inherently that we have, and they're like, "What is up?" Mm -hmm. And and that we tell them the story how we got here. And they are looking for answers and direction too. 
they want to be a part of the team. They want to be a part of help. They want things to be better too. And make no mistake about it, you may not know what you need, but you still know that you don't want any more of what you have. And I feel like that's how I was as a young person and a lot of other young people can relate. And so exposure is key. Um, we must expose them. Yes. Um, so um, I'm gonna go to the next question. We just got a few more minutes, Kim. So I'm gonna, you know, um, not that I don't want to keep it too brief, but I got about a few more questions I want to get in before you comment. So um, Imani said, how do you get the community into your space programming, social media, flyers, mail? Um, so our community has been built up over time uh, and it's through warm markets. So how do you get the community into your space of programming? And I, so I guess that's the key operative word. Remember the English language is my enemy. The community means as if it's like this big thing may be separated from you. And the reason that I said warm market is because you have to know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. Um, it's not this separate stranger. Stop looking for this, the community. Find your community. Operate from your center, your identity. Invite your friends. Have them invite their friends and their aunts and their cousins. Keep it in the warm market and ask your warm market to invite their warm market. And eventually you'll be seven people away from you. Every person is only seven people away from you. Even Oprah, you know, she was in Baltimore before. Listen, everybody is seven people away. Stop looking for the community and work with your community. Ask your community to work with their community. And when you keep it in the warm market, you won't need a flyer. You just send out text message at a certain point. Mama Rashida, she can talk about that. Do you know how big her community is? It's all of Baltimore. Do you know how it got that way? I'm sure that she can tell you that's another class, but you know, just see yourself as a part of the community and engage and start with where you are. Yes. Okay. Um, Samsara said, thank you for sharing. How do you earn trust in communities that are not your own overseas? Um, so consistency is key wherever you are, whether it's in your community or communities overseas, your own community won't trust you if you aren't consistent. People that have been knowing you all your life, they'll trust that you won't be consistent. Oh yeah, she won't be back next time. <laughs> Whatever consistency looks like for you, you'll need that wherever you go. Um, in terms of me and communities overseas, um, grass bottom and grass tops. Um, some of the communities I worked with, uh, I was accepted because I showed up with the president. <laughs> so in the Gambia, they accepted me initially because on the surface, they kind of had no choice. It's like, like, oh, she's working with the president. Well, who is she? She must be somebody if she's working with the president. But that's what got me in the door. The reason I uh, stayed and they allowed me to stay once the hoopla around this artist working with the president was gone was because of my work ethic. They trusted the fact that I would wipe toilets and I would wash down walls, I would hang shelves, I would sweep the front of our office porch just like I would ask anybody else to do. Um, when they ate, I didn't mind, you know, I. I don't like, they have a big bowl and everybody eats from the same bowl and they're sharing and that's very communal, but I don't really like that, but I'm the same. It wasn't because it was them. I'm the same me in Gambia as I am with my own brothers and sisters. I don't like to share water with my brothers and sisters. If you're the kind of person that, oh, here's my lollipop, you can take us up. No, thank you. I'm that kind of person. And once they realize that Kim is Kim, wherever she is, they trusted that. Not that they trusted the honesty or me being this epitome of honesty, but they trusted the consistency that I would show up unapologetically who I was every time. That's something that they could count on. And so they, they saw me as reliable. And I think that matters. Reliability, consistency. These are the things that breed trust. Um, I want to add to that just for a second, especially in overseas communities on the continent. Um, so everybody overseas is still really communal and um, on the continent, I mean, and you have to belong to a family. 
And so one of the things that really helped me was when, like, you have to be introduced to the community by a family. Like somebody has to adopt you. You can't just show up and say, I want to help. It doesn't matter how good your idea is or who knows you. Um, it helps when you walk in with the president, but still you need a family. Uh, somebody's family has to adopt you. You have to be the sister, the brother. It still kind of works that way overseas. And I, I think it works here a little bit, but we don't acknowledge it the same way. And um, so again, who you know, uh, building relationships with a family in the communities in Africa, that's how I was able to begin working there on a long-term basis and build real results. Because one of the families in each of the regions where we work kind of adopted me and signed off to say, yeah, we'll be accountable. But if she messed up, like if that's, that's really what the adoption is saying. Like if you do damage, we're the ones you can come back and see. Um, she won't just disappear into the night. You can come and tell on her to us. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I know we have a little bit of time, but I've got to say, um, thank you very much, Kim, for, for sharing tonight. But I do want to say, um, guys, when I went, I got to bring up Teaching Artists at the Summer Learning Institute. And I'm bringing it up because you all know I went last year, or some of you might not know, but I went last year, me and, and Mama Ade, who's on here from Ohio, we, we went on the trip with um, the Teaching Artists Institute for the summer learning. We were instructors with working with at two separate uh, universities, in um, one in Bagamoyo and one in Arusha. And I have to tell you, um, Kim did such a great job in her organization in um, everything was so smooth from making sure our visas were, you know, together, companioning us through the process because there was COVID going on and all of that. And, you know, companioning us through that whole process, being sure we had all the things that we needed. And when we got there, every day was a new experience. Uh, we had, um, because we were in Zanzibar. Um, we, we, we hit the ground running though. We stayed in five-star hotels. We stayed in not so five-star hotels, <laughs> but they were all beautiful with their own experiences. The food was wonderful. We met some amazing people. The young people that I work with, they transformed my own life really. Um, going to visit the Maasai village. We, we went to the safari, some of us, um, uh, uh, climb Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. It was such, but every day it was something else that we were doing. And I learned so much on this trip and um, the exchange of culture and the exchange of love was so powerful that I came back just renewed, mm -hmm. you know, able to work some more and doing what I'm doing and working in community and working with other people in their community and finding out how they did things in Tanzania because they did some great work there, work with uh, a, another artist who works with um, children who are, who are um, autistic children and an amazing work that, that um, John Gambula was doing in, in the arts in that way. Mama so Sorry. I would like for you all, please look up Teaching Artists Institute. Um, if you're thinking about traveling this summer they're going back to, they're going to Gambia and Tanzania. And um, so if you'd like to have an experience with um, traveling abroad, because many, many times we travel abroad, particularly in institutions, we go to France and we go to England and places like that and never do, um, hardly ever do they consider going to Africa. And I am telling you, it was absolutely powerful. It was wonderful. It was you know, um, and with her leadership and, you know, companioning us on this tour, it was just the best that I have ever been on. And I just wanted to say that to you, Kim, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> the difference, uh, when we go on the continent, a lot of times, you know, we're the first uh, that they've met, you know, like uh, you might be the first American, you may be the first black, or indigenous person, like you may be the first. So you're representing your whole community. And so it makes a difference who you bring. And I'm excited that I got to bring Mama Rashida because now they think Baltimore is dope. <laughs> they like, ah, Mama Rashida, y'all from Baltimore, Stephanie, you know, they say, oh, okay, I want to go to Baltimore. You know, that's, <laughs> I guess.
uh, <laughs> haven't seen the wire, but you know, <laughs> to have them say, I want to go to your village. I want to see what y'all doing, because if everybody that is there or anything like y'all, like it's going to be an incredible experience. And so thank you for showing up and representing us well. Um, it makes a difference because they don't always want you to come back. Um, so when they keep connected to you and they want you to come back and it's like, no, please come stay at my house, eat with me like that. That's important. That makes a difference. Thank you, Mama Rashid. Yeah. So um, thank you, Alexa, for putting the um, the website in the um, in the in the link. And also, uh, Josh asked, "Can ESA dogs come?" Yeah, why not? Definitely, we can. Yeah, yeah, we can make that happen. Um, please, if you are interested in any of the things that we do now or in the future, uh, please inbox us on Facebook. We can talk about the dog visa. We can talk about the drums because we have a tour uh, drum dance uh, in October. If you want to learn more about that drumming and dancing uh, on the continent. Um, yes, let's talk about all that. If you want to engage with us with our programs right here in Baltimore um, or in the U.S. Um, this summer or fall or in the future, please facebook.com slash teaching artists, one word. And even if um, you don't engage, please like us on Facebook. We're not uh, very good at social media. So every like counts. I would appreciate it. I am going to ask for a copy of this recording and share it on our YouTube channel. Please go to Thai TV. See Thai TV. We don't have many subscribers, but you will help us raise those numbers and learn more about our work because we have videos from a lot of our they're teaching artists around the world, our international army of teaching artists that are doing community arts integration, uh, just like you. Absolutely. And we took yoga every day. <laughs> With Mugisha. A young yoga teacher from, uh, from Uganda, and he was wonderful. Yeah. You said facebook.com uh, slash? Teaching artists, one word. Mm -hmm. Kim, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Paula again. I'm the director of the program. Uh, and I so appreciate your coming. Uh, your story, okay. Uh, and the way that you tell it and the information that fits in it, okay, fits inside it and makes it uh, relative to what we do. I really appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you for who you are. And I appreciate you for the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope that we can get you to engage. I have told Mama Rashida I am coming on, uh, not this summer, but summer after. <laughs> yes, we're going to hold you to it. I, I get it. Okay. We were talking about sabbatical. Mine has been deferred. We only get a sabbatical every seven years. Okay. And so mine has been deferred. So I'm starving. Okay, okay, I'm really starving right now. Um, and then those who are second year students are starving in a different way uh, from overload. So at this class, Mama Rashida's cohort. Uh, so there are several uh, there uh, in this audience tonight who I hope will take you up on this offer. Okay, because they will be commencing in May. Yay, it will be great. Yeah. <laughs> But okay. I, I'm, I'm planning to come. I'm going to bring my partner with me. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I wanted to, um, I think somebody, everybody fill out the form. Uh, everybody see that. Susan said, I'm glad to know about your work. Thank you, Kim and Mfaka for the invite. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Kenneth said, thank you for sharing your energy and your experience, Kim. Hope we cross paths again. Yes. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's our time is up on the mic, ain't it up? Yeah, it's up. Um, but I, I did want to say that I really appreciate um, the way you articulated what you do, Kim. Because a lot of times when I hear, when I talk about um, my practice as a community artist and when I hear about it, especially in an institution level, 
a lot of the words get bounced around so quickly and so easily that it gets lost in translation and lost in the action of it all. So I really appreciate appreciate you for like really um, elaborating on what you do and what that means for you. But also more specifically, when I think Imani asks about like how you connect with the community. And for me last year, when I was uh, really coming out with my thesis, I had a moment of feeling like I was distant from my community because I would say things like the community and that really like, you know, had that uh, connection. So to, uh, to say not too many words, <laughs> thank you so much again for uh, giving your perspective and just how to do it, you know, how to show up as yourself and just um, not to think too much about it, but just be authentic in the way you do it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Mama Ade, I'm gonna just let you say so long to us. She she's on a, on here from Ohio. I just wanted her to just say a word before we go. She traveled with us and was one of our teaching artists. She's a very very great artist in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address your earlier question about community arts MFA, and um, the definition I had was masterfully feeding all, masterfully or mindfully <laughs> feeding all, because that's what we do as artists. We feed them mentally, spiritually, physically, um, uh, and through our creative expression that, um, that, that, that imparts to the senses, you know, through sight, through sound, through hearing, through, you know, taste. It's, that's how we feed the people. And, um, you know, art is everything. Art is everything. Yes, Thank, you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us tonight too. Okay, that's it, everybody. I can mm -hmm. say love. What y'all want to say? Open your mic and say something. Thank you. Appreciate you. you. All Thank of you, Kim. You. You've been Thank wonderful, you. beautiful. My love camera is how it sucks. Thank you. <laughs> All that.